And if you're interested, you should see the library staff and check that out. This evening we have a gentleman called Walter Bernstein that we're going to honor and have him tell you tales of his life and times. And our sponsor is Shelter Allender and famous dentist Dr. Daniel Moran. <laughs> Well, anyway, welcome, and we're really happy that we got such a nice turnout tonight. We've been very fortunate to have a lot of people come down and take part in these things, and so we're always glad when people come. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to find a way to make this continue next year, although we've really made it a wintertime affair, so I would expect maybe around December or January we might start up again. One of the people I'd certainly like to interview is Bob Markell, who's here tonight. He's an old friend of Walter's uh, from television days. But in any case, uh, some of you may recall that uh, I had hosted a talk show for several years on Long Island Public Radio. It all ended rather abruptly after a change of management at the college, but one of the things which disappointed me about that unhappy conclusion was the fact that I never got a chance to interview a fellow Shelter Islander, Walter Bernstein. Tonight I'm actually meeting him for the first time. Some of you may know Walter's work more than you may know Walter, as he was a screenwriter of grand reputation, who began getting noticed writing for the legendary television programs Danger and You Are There for a fledgling network called CBS in the late 40s and early 50s. He went on to write the screenplay for such films as The Magnificent Seven, Paris Blues, Fail Safe, Semi Tough, Yanks, An Almost Perfect Affair, The Betsy, and The House on Carroll Street, among others. But it was in 1976 that he penned a semi autobiographical screenplay for a film which was actually all Bernstein and one which seemed to define his significance in American history, which he called The Front. Woody Allen became the star. And Walter Bernstein, a man who had been completely shunned by the Hollywood establishment for his principles for so many years, was nominated for the highest award given by that same establishment, an Academy Award. The Oscar, unfortunately, went to the movie Network, but Bernstein became at once pariah and cause celeb. A horrible wrong had not been righted but exposed, and Walter became a spokesman for a person's right in a true democracy to a dissenting opinion. All of us who hold a strong sense of right and wrong, a sense of fairness and justice, will likely never find our principles tested beyond a <coughs> dinner conversation. We can say we would stand up against bullies, speak out against injustice, face down a foe who would seek to destroy us or someone we love or even a stranger. Very few of us are ever tested. In 1950, Walter Bernstein was tested when he found himself blacklisted by the House Un-American Activities Committee for having been America, a member of the American Communist Party. Like many intellectuals and people of conscience in the 1920s and 30s, Walter saw the inequities in America, the concentration of wealth, the abuse of the working class, and the impact of poverty. During the Great Depression, the great American experiment seemed to be failing miserably, and people of conscience saw the philosophies of Karl Marx to be a possible remedy. They read communist literature and gathered to discuss such ideas as labor unions and social security, and they spoke out against injustice and censorship. Walter Bernstein has been one of those people. The House on American Activities Committee, later headed by the nefarious Senator Joseph McCarthy, told CBS that Bernstein was a communist and that they should immediately terminate him unless he was willing to admit it and accuse others. He refused. As a result, he was not permitted to work for some 10 years. The American Congress, in a stated effort to save America from communists who would threaten our way of life, became the thing they most reviled and decided to strip some of its citizens of their rights under the U.S. Constitution. Few objected. They were too afraid. A small number of those accused stood their ground for themselves and for their fellows and for what was right. Among those few was Walter Bernstein. As in those years following World War II, we live today in an America where fear rules the day, when we are threatened from forces outside these precious borders, and when we can seem willing to forget who we are and what we stand for because we are afraid. I can think of no one who can tell the cautionary tale better than Walter Bernstein, and I am proud to introduce him to you all this evening. What you, will not, what you will hear may not be pretty, but it must be said and heard. As he himself has said in his memoirs, should we fail to learn the lessons of history, 
we will be condemned to repeat them as folly. Welcome, Walter Bernstein. Well, I just would like to start, uh, I guess we have to start somewhere, and, and I suppose that like 90% of the known world, uh, you were raised in that hotbed of revolution, Brooklyn. <laughs> Can you tell us how things started there? Like things. <laughs> the beginning how, I, how I started, I I, you know, I was raised in Brooklyn, uh, very close to Ebbets Field. Some of you may remember where the Brooklyn Dodgers played. Uh, and uh, grew up in a, you know, a lower class, uh, lower class, I thought of them as lower class, lower middle class uh, Jewish family. Not political, really. Uh, and uh, grew up, went to high school in Brooklyn, Erasmus. Uh, went on to there to Dartmouth, kind of to my surprise. Uh, I'd never been away before, but my father had some kind of connection and got me into Dartmouth, although my, uh, my marks were terrible. And uh, the thing I remember most about Dartmouth then was when I first got there, it was full of prep school kids from all over the country, you know. And it, was, it was the first time I had seen uh, boys wearing jackets that didn't match their pants. <laughs> <laughs> where I came from, you either wore a sweater or a suit, you only do from a sport jacket. <laughs> anyway, I got through Dartmouth one way or the other and, and maybe went into the Army. Uh, and uh, politically, I came from a, a, a generation that uh, was influenced mainly by two things, by the Depression and by fascism. And uh, the, uh, the, the Depression was terrible, it was awful. And uh, it seemed, as Dan said, that, you know, there was a system that wasn't working. Uh, and then, as far as fascism was concerned, there was the rise of Mussolini, the rise of Hitler. There was the war in Spain in 1936. And uh, it seemed to me that the communists were the uh, people out in front in fighting fascism and uh, doing something about unemployment. Uh, and then during the war, uh, I was uh, in the army, I was in the infantry. And then I got on to a, an army magazine called Yank, which is a wonderful, wonderful magazine. Uh, it's a weekly, and for, really for the enlisted men. And I'm very lucky to be sent overseas uh, uh, for Yank, and went through the campaigns in Sicily and Italy, and then managed to get into Yugoslavia uh, while I was still German-occupied, and... Uh, uh, interviewed Marshal Tito there, which uh, I was almost court martial when I got out because I wasn't supposed to be in there. Anyway, the, the whole point of this is that I came out of the uh, uh, came out of this war, which was basically won by the Red Army, and uh, uh, became a communist and was a communist for ten years from 1946 to 1956. Uh, I don't know how much more of my biography you need here, but uh, uh, I got, I'd always wanted to write movies, and I had a, a book published after the war, which had uh, pieces from the New Yorker that I had written while I was in the Army, and on the basis of that, I got a job in Hollywood, and... Uh, but did you, you also wrote for the New Yorker. I written, yeah, I yeah, I've written for the New Yorker. I sold them a short story while I was still in college, uh, which I remember mainly because uh, they sent me a check of fifty dollars, and uh, which was an enormous amount of money. And then two weeks later, they sent me another check for thirty dollars, saying they hadn't paid me enough. Then <laughs> so, uh, that was the I agreed. To, my ambition could be published in, in the New Yorker at that time. And I just remember I had a big fight with my parents about the $80. Uh, 
about who is to get it. Uh, uh, and after a bitter fight, we, we, we settled. I remember I uh, spent $30 for an overcoat and $50 for a secondhand phonograph and two albums of records. It was the first <clears throat> money I made from writing. Uh, but anyway, I came back from Hollywood. I'd been in Hollywood for six months and went into uh, uh, what was the beginning of television then. And uh, I was very lucky to have met Bob Markell, who's this wonderful artist and uh, uh, scene designer for the uh, shows I worked on, Danger, and then particularly you are there. And then uh, I got blacklisted. And it was not, it's hard to, des to describe what was happening then because it seemed uh, so totally unexpected. I mean, one minute it seemed we were great friends with the Soviet Union, the next minute they were enemies. And if you were on the left at all, or certainly as I was a communist, although uh, I was not in any functional sense a communist, uh, but there was a, uh, there were two ex-FBI men who uh, had an organization I called AWARE, which was to uh, make people, and particularly uh, the networks, uh, uh, aware that they were hiring communists or left-wing people or communist sympathizers. And they published a uh, little booklet called Red Channels. There was a, it was about, it was a compilation of about 150 or 60 names of people in the uh, entertainment industry. Writers, actors, directors, uh, musicians, with a listing of their so-called communist activities, so, uh, what they had supported. And if you were in Red Channels, you were automatically blacklisted unless you went and cleared yourself. I think there were about seven or eight listings from me. They were all true. I had uh, supported the, the Spanish government in the Spanish Civil War. I had written for communist publications. I supported some organization for uh, Negro veterans. I forget what some of the others were. I remember I came in that book right after Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> very distinguished at my association. Anyway, if you were if you were in red channels, uh, you were unemployable after that, unless, as I said, you went to clear yourself. And there were several ways you could clear yourself. You could go, of course, to the House Committee on, on American Activities. There were several uh, uh, columnists for. New York newspapers, the uh, the World Telegram, the Journal American, there's a man named Sikolsky, and a man named Frederick Waltman. And uh, they were very right-wing right columnists. And uh, if you went there uh, and they gave you their okay, uh, you would be cleared. Uh, unfortunately, the okay consisted of not only saying you were sorry and what you did and you were against the communists and uh, it was naming names. Uh, unless you name names, you could not get cleared. That was really the, the bottom line of it. So that even if you changed your mind about what you believed in or you really believed it, that that was not enough. And that was really what became the sticking point for uh, a number of people. It was the, uh, uh, the certain things that, you know, uh, you, you didn't do. And uh, uh, so when I uh, was not uh, employable then for what became like 10 years in uh, movies and about 12 years in uh, television. Now, did somebody actually approach you and tell you that you were blacklisted, or this is something that people just were shunning you? Or? Well, I was writing a, a, a show for CBS 
called Danger. It was, uh, the original director was Yul Brynner, and then he left. I remember very reluctantly, he'd been offered a part in this, in this show, and he said, this is a <laughs> he was having such a good time, he wanted to be a director. You know, and, uh, uh, but then he went and he did, and of course it was The King and I, and uh, so he never came back. <laughs> he was replaced by Sidney Lumet, and uh, it was a very successful show, it was a half hour melodrama show. And uh, uh, I was writing it, I'd written several shows for them, and one day the producer was a very nice man, a former actor named Charles Russell, and he took me aside, he said, I can't hire you anymore. And I said, why not? And he said, uh, you're on some kind of list. He said, I, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you this. I'm supposed to tell you we're just changing the focus of the show, we're getting different kinds of writers. But he told me anyway, and he was very sweet, very nice man, totally non-political. He just thought well, that what was happening was bad. And uh, he said, uh, but put another name on it. Uh, and I'd had some experience before that with the name thing. I had got a call one time from my uh, agent, and he said, I have a job for you to write a, what was then called an audition script, which is a pilot script for a, an advertising agency. In those days, the advertising agencies did a number of the shows. And uh, I wrote the script and uh, gave it to the agent to turn. And he said, well, you know, maybe you should put a different name on it. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, there's talk and stuff, and it doesn't matter. Put another name on it. So I said, OK. And I put another name on it. I forgot about it. Then I got a call from him saying, uh, the producer wants to see you up at the advertising agency. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he has some notes for the writer. And I said, well, I can't go up with this guy, but people know me up there. And uh, he said, well, he wants to see the writer. He's, got, he's paid for this. He's got a right to see the writer. And I said, I'm not going to do it. You know, I can't go up there. It's somebody else. And he got very angry. And, uh, then a little while later, he called me back. He said, I fixed it. I got it all fixed. I said, great, what'd you do? He said, well, I took the, uh, I told the producer this, the writer is not being cooperative, and I took him off the script. And I got another writer to do the rewrite. <laughs> and I said, great, fine, who'd you get? He said, you. Uh, uh, I said, what do you, I said, well, why can you, he said, I, I told him all the is going to be up there at 5 o'clock this afternoon. And I said, why do you do that in the first place? He said, never mind. Just go up and, and see him. And I went up and I saw the producer. He was a very nice man. And I listened to him while he told me, you know, uh, what a rat the other writer was. And, uh, he, would never hire, he would never hire him again for tugging out on the rewrite. And... Uh, he gave me the notes he had, and I went and did them, turned it in, and he was very satisfied. He said, uh, he said, why didn't he get you in the first place? You obviously a much better writer. <laughs> so, by the time Russell came to me and said, I can't hire you, I had a little inkling of what was on. And he said, put another name on the script, and I did. And, uh, uh, wrote for a while under this different name, but by then the networks and studios, I guess, also. Uh, this was all in New York, by the way, this was not in Hollywood. Uh, figured that the writers were sneaky people anyway, and they were, might be using different names. Uh, and they insisted that there be a, a live person who uh, would appear as the writer. They wouldn't satisfy just for them. So then it became a question that, uh, of finding somebody who would be what we call a front. That is somebody who would give you his name and if necessary go up and have meetings. And, uh, a lot of these people were not writers though, am I right? Well, it, 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 it varied. Uh, some people it was hard finding somebody who would do that. Uh, uh, you, some, sometimes it was someone who wanted to, to be a writer or wanted to get credits. 
themselves and agreed to do it. Uh, some people did it for money. They would take a percentage of what you got. Uh, the one uh, person who lasted the longest for me was someone who just did it because he was uh, uh, he was against it. He thought it was a bad thing. And also he got kind of a kick out of doing it. <laughs> you know, he, he would, uh, uh, there was one man who did it, a very nice man, and, uh, and uh, did it for a little while and came he said, I can't do it anymore, uh, because he had some kind of little job that paid him nothing at all, and he refused to take any money from me. He was really doing it out of principle, and uh, he was, his friends came around to borrow money. They said, hey, you're doing these shows, they're on the money. And his parents wanted money, and it, 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 it just became intolerable for him. And, you know, and he, really, he really had to stop. Then uh, there, there was some woman who was the girlfriend of a friend of mine who wanted to be a writer. She thought that would be fun. And uh, she did a couple, several of them. and. Uh, then she came to me and said, I can't do this anymore. I said, why not? She said, well, her psychiatrist said it was bad for her. <laughs> and uh, I said, what was, what's bad about it? You, you know, everybody thinks you're this writer. You're enjoying it. every good time. And she said, well, her analyst had said uh, she shouldn't be enjoying it. That was bad. <laughs> anyway, it was a, it was a, you know, talking about it, it it's, it's comic, and a lot of it was, was, was kind of comic. And but you were also struggling to eat at the time, right? To eat. Yeah. And pay the rent. And, uh, well, I, you know, the writers were, were luckier than the actors or the directors, because they had to show their faces. They, you know, they had to appear, you know. Uh, if we were lucky, we could get the front. We could get, I was lucky. You know, I was able to get enough friends, friends to survive. I had people like Sidney Lumet and Charles Russell uh, who knew what was going on and uh, uh, who risked. They themselves uh, were not blacklisted, but if it had been found out that they were hiring black people, uh, they would have been blacklisted. And there were people, you know, who, who took that, those kind of risks, like the, to whom, you know, an enormous you know, uh, did not only respect but admiration, you know, for, for what they stuck their necks out. And uh, they were not particularly left-wing people. They didn't believe what I believe particularly, but they did it because they thought it was wrong. And they took, they, they took, a, they took a big risk. Uh, the You Are There was a very successful show, and Walter Cronkite introduced it, if you remember, yeah, this one of the days is the day like all of the days. Uh, and I always wondered whether he knew uh, that blacklisted people were writing the show. And uh, I met him a couple years ago when we did the live broadcast of uh, Failsafe, and he was there, and I went up to him, I'd never met him before, and I asked him if he knew, and he said he didn't, hadn't known for the first year but he thought it was funny because no writers ever showed up. <laughs> and, uh, and then I think after the first year when the show was very, was established and doing very well, that uh, Lynette and Russell took him out for a drink and told him that this was being re written. Because it was not only, I was not the only one, there were two other blacklist writers who uh, were writing that show and told him what was happening. He, of course, you know, went along with it. Well, who are some of the other uh, actors, uh, especially the people might recognize, who were blacklisted? You were know, you friendly with Zero Mostel. Well, Zero Mostel, uh, Zero Mostel was uh, of the writers whom you might know. I guess the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sterling Hayden was blacklisted, and then uh, he became an informer and was reinstated, and then he hated himself for it. and went around for quite a while speaking uh, against the blacklist and uh, saying that he had been ashamed of himself for what he had done. Uh, Edward G. Robinson was, was, had to 
perform a kind of mea culpa because he had been a liberal man. John Garfield, if you remember him, uh, was himself, he had never been a communist. Uh, his wife may have been, but he had never been, but they had been his friends from the old group theater. And they put a lot of pressure on him. And he, he was a, I knew him somewhat. I'd written some stuff for him. And he was a very sweet, rather naive, very nice man. He desperately wanted to be a movie star. He liked being a movie star. And uh, at the same time, the biggest, the way he had come from the streets in New York, and there was no bigger crime than being a snitch. And uh, that's what they wanted him to do. I mean, the committee called him, and he, you know, tried to say a lot of things, but the one thing he would not do would be the, the names, and they asked him, you know, the names of people he'd been with in the group theater, and uh, probably some kind of meetings that he'd been to. And, uh, he solved his problem by dying, had a heart attack, and uh, uh, the, uh, several of the directors got away, they got to England, uh, it was hard for the directors because, as I said, they couldn't work uh, under the table like the writers could. Now, what were the, the, the uh, committee was actually threatening people with incarceration, am I right? Well, the committee... Uh, one thing I think you have to realize is that the, the entertainment people were kind of a small part of what was going on. I mean, the blacklist uh, extended to, to lawyers, to doctors, to teachers, to union people. Uh, they liked going after us because they could get their names in the paper because of the association. Uh, but we were just you know, actually a small, you know, a small part of what was, of what was going on. Uh, they were after the left wing of the union movement, and it was all part of the Cold War. It was part of an attempt to establish, you know, conformity. Uh, and uh, you know, the uh, the actors, the, you know. There were no big stars, really, but, uh, but Garfield was probably the only big star that I, that I knew of. Uh, and, you know, all these, I, the, the idea that the, the, the Reds were influencing the content of movies and trying to get some first of ideas in was nonsense. I mean, that these studios uh, knew what was going on. They knew control the content of the movies. They did. Nothing went into the movies that they didn't want to go in. And it was very, uh, I remember the first time I got out there, I had a job for 10 weeks for a uh, writer, director, producer named Robert Rosson. And I was working on a movie called All the King's Men. And uh, Rosson was a, a left-wing guy. He'd been out in Hollywood for 13 years or so by then. And I remember being in his office, and he wanted to move his desk to a different part of the room. Move it around, and a man appeared in the doorway, uh, and uh, rather tough looking guy, and said, What are you doing? And Russell said, Don't put it over there. He said, No, nah, I shouldn't go there. And he came over, started to help us move it someplace else, and he was eyeing me, and uh, uh, he was the head of the studio, Harry Cohn. Uh, he was moving it around, and uh, we then said to Russell, Who's that one of your commie writers? You know, Russell said, Yeah. <laughs> and I said, okay. It didn't, didn't mean anything to him. He didn't, you know, the, the studio heads didn't want the blacklist. They really didn't. Uh, but they were not a, about to buck the government. Didn't uh, Louis B. Mayer and Samuel Goldwyn cooperate with them? Well, Mayer was a very right-wing guy. Goldwyn was, I don't know what, what, uh, what he was. Uh, but they quite, you know, it was a, it's hard to describe the time. It's hard to, uh, now, if, I say to people, uh, I would walk down the street and other people, a producer or something like that who knew me, would cross the street to avoid uh, seeing me. Uh, there was an atmosphere of fear. We were contagious in some kind of way uh, because you could be, you know, picked up. You could be uh, blacklisted really for very little. I mean, they went after the communists uh, initially, and after a while they ran out of communists. But, you know, and uh, uh, 
But people were scared. People were very, very scared. And, uh, uh, it was a frightening time. Really you, you also had the, the FBI following you and your mail opened? And well, you assumed, I don't know, but you assumed your mail was being opened, your phone was being tapped. I don't know whether it ever was, but what I did know is that uh, every few weeks I'd get a visit from the FBI. And there's always two men, and uh, they kind of look alike in, in, in some way. Like they, I remember saying that they, they looked like they weren't really related, but they came from the same orphanage. <laughs> and, uh, they, they, they were very polite. Um, they would knock on my door, and they, I'd answer, and they'd say uh, who they were. They'd say, we'd like to talk to you, and I'd say, well, i got nothing to say, and they'd go away. But what was interesting was that it wasn't only coming to your house. I mean, they would stop me when I got off a bus. They would stop me on the street, stop me once on a subway platform. Always very polite, always very nice, but what they were saying, in a sense, was, you know, we know where you are. You know, and we can be there at any time, and that was scary. That was, you know, and, uh, uh, and after a while, for the end of the ten years, that kind of stopped. Instead of coming every few weeks, they came every few months. Then that stopped me. Just called me on the phone. <laughs> one man I remember, Wally Graubard, his name was. And uh, you had the sense he had a list that he was going down. He just called me. He would call me, talk. I'd say, "How are you? It's fine." I said, "How's your family? It's fine." We talk about that. He said, "You want to talk?" I say, "No." He say, "Goodbye." <laughs> And uh, I don't know about the mail and stuff like that. I know that the building I lived in, the, uh, the superintendent of the building said that they came to him and wanted to know essentially what was in my garbage, what magazines I was reading, subscribing to, things like that. Wasted time. But now there were things that, that they were doing uh, as far as giving you choices. So when many of the people who were faced with being investigated by the committee were brought before the committee and given certain choices, you found a crafty way to avoid all that, if I recall from your memoirs, by avoiding them. Altogether. Well, I, uh, I avoided it by going on the lamp, is what I heard. And uh, they weren't given any choice. There weren't any real choices. The choice you had is to name names or not. That was really the only choice that you had. Because I know people who had been disenchanted with the communists by that time. Uh, and uh, were called before the committee, you know, and were perfectly prepared to say, listen, I'll tell you about myself. I don't like the communists anymore. I don't like what they did. But I won't give you any names. And the committee didn't, they didn't need the names. They had all the names. They had everybody's name. They didn't need it. They wanted your name. They wanted to be able to say, well, look, this person is, a, is, this person is on our, our side. He believes what we, what we believe. Uh, in my case, I found out, this was rather late, this was in, I think, 1958 or so, and it was a little, uh, the committee was coming to New York, and uh, I was supposed to have, I'd written a, uh, it, the blacklist was kind of breaking up at that time, and I got a call from Sidney Lumet, who was directing films then. He was directing a movie for Sophia Loren, and uh, uh, he got me a job on it, too. Write the, write the script, and uh, I was writing it, and it was for Paramount Pictures, and they were pleased with it, and they were going to offer me uh, another contract. And I got a call from my agent saying, Paramount won't sign the contract for you. So one night he said, they heard there was a, a subpoena out here from the committee. It was interesting that they knew, Paramount knew, and uh, so I said, thank you very much, and I packed my bag, and I took it on the lamp. I went up to a friend's place in uh, Rhode Island and continued working on the script. And the committee had its hearings here, and I wasn't served. And uh, then they went back to Washington. It was the last hearing they had in New York. And uh, I called my agent, and I said, well, what about... Paramount now that, you know, I haven't 
been an unfriendly witness or anything. He said, no, they, you know, uh, they're still leery about it. And at that time, the producer of the film was uh, Sophia Loren's husband, Carlo Ponti, who was uh, uh, very rich, very smart, uh, Italian man, didn't know much English. And uh, uh, Paramount had said, no, we won't, you know, we won't uh, hire him unless he goes and testifies. So, and uh, Ponte came to New York. And we had a meeting, myself and my lawyer, and Bundy and an interpreter, because he didn't speak English very well. And uh, a lawyer explained what my position would be, which was essentially I was perfectly prepared to go and testify. And I was willing to tell him anything about myself at that point. I didn't care, but I wouldn't name any names. And uh, then the interpreter rattled, told this to, uh, in Italian, to Bundy. And Ponte rattled off a long stream of Italian. Mm -hmm. And the interpreter turned to us and said, Mr. Ponte, we'd like to know who has to be fixed and for how much. And he all these hands he said, it's politics, it's politics. You know, it was nonsense to him. You know, politically, you fix something. They're only Congress, you know. They, they, uh, so at the end, movies were what support, not, you know, not this other stuff. So, but that was a choice. That was really basically the, the, the final choice you had, was where you going to think the warranty. Weren't some people sort of forced into perjuring themselves if they didn't give the right answers, or they were sort of... Uh... Well, people try to, you know, you try to get out of it, because the point was that legally, uh, if I went in and said, okay, this is what I did, this is what I belong to, this is what I did, the rest of that, uh, but I won't give you names. Once I had answered the question about myself and said I did that, if I didn't answer the question about names, I was liable for contempt and could go to jail. That was why people took the Fifth Amendment, basically. Because once you answered one question, you couldn't say, oh, I'll answer this, but I won't answer that. Uh, but taking the Fifth Amendment didn't help you. No, I mean, if you took the Fifth Amendment, you were also blacklisted. Either you were a cooperative witness or, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, you weren't, uh, essentially. But, uh, now, but there, were, there were people who did cooperate. Uh, well, there were people, yes, there were people who gave names and continued to work. And uh, they did it for various reasons. They did it uh, because they were scared. They did it because they wanted to work. They were frightened. They had families. Uh, they did it. Who knows why they did it? They had different reasons. Uh, I had a good friend who was a very talented writer who was blacklisted and was doing very well under the table. He was writing scripts for producers under different uh, different names. And he was making a had a family. He was making a living. And... Uh, I was out in California for something, and I heard that he was working. I said, well, he couldn't be working. So the only way he could be working was that he would become a good and I didn't believe that of him. And I called him up. He was working at 20th Century Fox. We had breakfast. Uh, and I said, why? You know, and he had the most curious, but in a way understandable response. He said that at the screenings, they would have the first runnings of, of the movie that he wrote, that he, he said, I couldn't stand any more going in after the lights were out. <laughs> and I understood that in a funny way. He couldn't, in, in, in some way, his pride, his ego, his feeling about himself, that he had sneak into these, into the screenings of this, uh, these movies, you know, but, and his argument was, well, I only name names that the name before. You know, which is an argument that a number of people had on the basis they felt, well, they, these people who the name before and been black, they couldn't be heard again. Which wasn't true, because there were a number of people I knew who blacklisted and have gotten jobs, you know, not in the movie business, and uh, if they were named again, they lost those jobs. Uh, people didn't know about them. And, uh, 
this time was the Trump period. Now, this whole thing has not gone away completely because only a few years ago, uh, the Academy um, gave a, a Lifetime Achievement Oscar to Ilya Kazan, who was one of the people who named names, I understand, and still created a great deal of controversy at the time. Well, yeah, it did. Uh, uh, people still felt that, well, I said, they felt in particular about Kazan because he was the hottest director in America at Dave, that could you just at, tell us a couple of the movies? Well, Ilya Kazan, he had been a, originally a stage director. He had directed Death of a Salesman. He had directed Streetcar, Streetcar Named Desire. He had won an Oscar in the movies for directing Gentleman's Agreement. He had directed Zapata. He had directed On the Waterfront. He was really, really the, the hottest director around. And people felt that... Uh, if he hadn't given names, if he, that he might have been blacklisted in films in Hollywood, but he still could have continued to work on Broadway where there wasn't a blacklist, or he could have gone to England and worked there. And they felt in some way that, that being as powerful as he was, that, that uh, he had a kind of an obligation to stand up. I mean, he had betrayed him. I mean, a lot of people felt betrayed by him. And uh, so the feeling was very hot. What was interesting about that whole controversy in the whole about Kazan when it was you would think that this subject by now was you know was dead that nobody was that interested but all over the world really it was you know uh, it was talked about and brought up again and uh, I mean the only good thing about the you know the blacklist is that in some way it won't die you know it still keeps no uh, steaming up in, in one form or another. I think we have to count on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so. I think, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, we, we've always been a country when, uh, you know, when there's been an external enemy, uh, you know, that we played fast and loose with civil liberties. You know, in the, uh, you know, in the 50s, it was the Russians, the spies, and you know, back then it was communism. Today it's terrorism. You know, and we always run the danger, I think, and anyway, having seen it happen before, of what you said before, forgetting essentially you know, who we are or, or, or what the strength of this country is. You know, the strength of the country is not in stifling dissent. You know, it never has been. It's been in, in, in quite the opposite. The, other thing I'm trying to just want to say, it, there was nothing heroic about being blacklisted. I mean, we weren't heroes. Nobody was, it was not a time of heroism, really. It was a time of pain. And, you know, it was a time of a great deal of damage that was done. Uh, it was a sordid time. You know, it was not a heroic time. Uh, really, you know, it, and uh, uh, none of us were, you know, were, were heroes, really. And, uh, uh, I survived. I was lucky to survive. Uh, you made it to Shelter Island. I made it. So <laughs> that's, not, that's not just survival, that's living. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a content to survival. You know, and, uh, uh, no, a number of my friends didn't survive. Uh, some of them died, some of them never recovered, particularly the actors. You know that I knew who never got back to where they were, and uh, since so much of who they were depended on presenting present, presenting themselves, uh, there was damage sometimes. You know beyond repair. So some actors who felt well they could pick up where they left off ten years before, and it wasn't possible. Uh, and uh, it was tough. Do you have occasion to see any of these people? I think Sidney Lumet still lives somewhere. He lives so. in, in the Hamptons, yeah. Do you see him at all? Oh, yeah. Yes, we, we remain friends. And uh, there are people, you know, the, the, the ranks are thin. Uh, but uh, when I think of that time, and this is also something that, that uh, uh, there's a great deal about that time that I cherish and that I miss. Uh, and it was particularly the, the camaraderie that we had, 
the people helped each other, the blackness of people, we supported each other, we were there for each other, uh, among the writers, we helped each other with scripts, we helped each other try to find jobs, and, you know, in this dog-eat-dog -dog business that the movies are, or television even now, it was very precious, and I miss it, uh, there, I don't want it there, those times to happen again, but, uh, uh, you know, the, both the pleasure and the necessity of, uh, help, of, help, of helping each other, of being there for each other, it's very, very important. So do you feel even later in your life, now that you're, you're in your 50s, do you, do you feel any sense of bitterness about this, or have you become sort of philosophical about well, it? I never was bitter. You know, I think there are people who are bitter and there are people who aren't bitter. I was angry. And I think about it, it's a lot I feel very angry about. I lost, you know, a dozen years of what would have been very productive. I could trust part of my life and career. But uh, I, I, I never felt bitter. And, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why not. It's some lack in me forever. <laughs> Angry, yes, but not bitter. Now, of course, part of the national debate at the moment is the way that we, we're reacting to the changes in the world since 2001. Uh, certainly these things that are happening in the prisons in Iraq now were a great concern to many people. Do you have any special reaction to these things because of what you had gone through? Nah, no, no more than anybody else. I don't, I don't think that. Uh, but I, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, the, uh, ah, yeah, you know, to go, to go into that whole thing, but I, what I worry about things like the Patriot Act, that's what I worry about. I worry about what's that, that's doing to the country. I, I worry about what we're giving up in the name of fighting terrorism. I think the Iraq war is a disaster. I think the people running it are, you know, supremely incompetent. Uh, you know, uh, I think something was set up, you know, uh, uh, dealing with with, uh, uh, with Arabs. You know, there's a very strong racist element in that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared about what, uh, about what's happening. Uh, that's the only, you know, I don't have any solutions uh, about it, but uh, what what I believe in and what I think has to be fought for really is the right of dissent. The right of dissent of being able to say no, say, say no, to say no, I don't believe this. Uh, you know, I will fight against it. Uh, but that, to me, is the most important thing right now. Is there anybody that has any questions? The uh, uh, current Carlton Heston and Ronald Reagan are uh, quite prominent in giving the news. Reagan was with the screen actor film. He was a very liberal guy. He's asking if Ronald Reagan and Charlton Heston had been involved in giving names. Oh, has, uh, Reagan, I don't know whether he has names, names to give particularly, but Reagan had been the president of the Screen Actors Guild. He was a very liberal guy at one point, and then, but uh, went along with the blacklist when it happened, went along with the blacklisting of, of human vendors, essentially, you know. And Heston had always, you know, although Heston had been uh, prominent or, uh, during the uh, civil rights movement, He's been down there, he's been a very good guy during the, that period. And then he became a head of the NRA. You're right to bear on. Once the blacklist started, and as you continue to write, and as other writers who either had, had been blacklisted or had not, did you find yourself censoring ideas and being <coughs> cautious in terms of what you wrote during that time? Well, I, I, I wasn't writing anything original uh, at the time. I was, I was writing on assignment, you know, and uh, 
So I didn't have much chance. You know, I was writing for CBS most most of the time. Uh, I wasn't writing any movies during you know during that during that period. Uh, actually, in, I know how many of you remember you were there. You know, which is a reenact, reenactment of historical events over the centuries. Uh, or at the country, be careful. We you know we did a lot of. Uh, shows about civil liberties, about Galileo, about Savonarola, about, you know, we did, uh, to the point once when uh, uh, Charlie Russell, the producer, was uh, ran into Ed Murrow up at CBS, and Murrow said, you know, how are you getting away with this? Uh, uh, we got away with it simply because it was a very successful show, you know, and, uh, uh, but no, I didn't feel any, you know, in my particular case, that you need to, the self-censorship. And Bob Markell was the set designer. He was, as he, he built the Trojan horse. <laughs> <laughs> when we did the fall of Troy. He built Michelangelo's David, also oh. for it, I'm not sure, I forget what else, but he did. <laughs> he did, yeah. doctor. Yes. At what point uh, did you become disenchanted with the time of life? Well, I, I think it was a gradual process. Uh, you know, when I began to feel their, their uh, they really began to stop representing the American people as I saw it, you know, as they had when I first began. The culmination of it was, for me, was hungry. Really, that and the the, the crucial revelations that led to to think about something, you know things that. Uh, but by that time, people I think had begun to leave leave the party. You know, they thought it was you know no longer uh, relevant, essential. You know. I would like to ask you, in view of the <coughs> corporate mergers and the corporate gigantism that infect Hollywood, radio, entertainment generally, would you comment perhaps uh, about uh, Michael Moore's latest adventure with his <coughs> film Fahrenheit 9-11 uh, and Disney's refusal to distribute it because it might upset some Republican politicians? I didn't, I don't, I think it had something to do with Jeff Bush and, uh, in, in, in part, but they, you know, they, they, you can never underestimate, uh, you know, the, the greed or the cowardice of large corporations. <laughs> they, you know, CBS did it on the, on the Reagan biography, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I forget a couple of the other things that, that have happened. I mean, if there's, you know, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, they're scared. I mean, particularly, they're scared of the government. Uh, right now, they're very scared of the government, and uh, they're scared of any, you know, uh, anything that'll, you know, hurt them. What they see is, you know, their divine right to profits. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's not surprising to me that you know, that Disney wouldn't do it. It'd be very interesting to see what kind of distribution he does get. Uh, uh, speaking of CBS and cowardice, uh, since we are all CBS alumni, uh, <laughs> the main reason that CBS capitulated so quickly to the blacklist was because Congress controlled the funds for the Federal Communications Commission and it was made very clear to CBS and I'm sure the other networks that if they didn't go along with setting up a blacklist within their own network, that they might lose their FCC license. So the um, government set up an ex-FBI man to CBS who was put up in the corporate offices with Haley and Staten and, and set up the mechanism that CBS and he trained a young woman named Dorothy, and we never knew her last name, but Dorothy and her file wound up in my department 
which was called editing then and now is called program practices. And just to illustrate how absurd it all got, uh, I happened to work till 6 o'clock at night, so I was frequently the last one to leave the office, and I was instructed that I might get a phone call from the West Coast late in the day with a list of names, and they were names for Dorothy to clear. And I was just to write down the names and put them under Dorothy's file box. And one day, you know, on the end of the day, quarter to six at night, you can just see people who have just done a Sergeant Bill Cole, Bill Silver's episode. Oh my God, we forgot to call New York and clear the name. They call up, they give me a list of names, I put it under Dorothy. The next day, one of the cameramen on the Bill Cole production was on in Dorothy's file. They had to refilm the entire episode with another cameraman in order to get it on the air. O'Shea, his name was. <laughs> O'Shea was this guy they put in at that CBS. I remember that. Oh, yeah. you mean the, you mean the yeah, FBI? Yeah, yeah. Al Berry. Yeah. Linda, you were last dame at Blackrock, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, another a voice from another CBS alum is Walter. I, uh, I worked in Cronkite in the later years, and I remember one time he was talking about the You Are There experience, and he said that he began to notice the scripts, no matter where they were set, whether it was the assassination of Caesar or the bonfire of the vanities, or God, there would be this marvelously stirring language about, about liberty and about the, the, uh, the evils of suppression of it. And one day, I said, he happened to just remark, he said, my God, some of these scripts are so strong and powerful that it almost seems like they've been written by a, a, a blacklist writer. <laughs> and at that point, the met and Charles Russell said, we better take him out here and drink <laughs> But I wanted to ask you, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. John Henry Falk, uh, a lot of people believe that it was his winning of that uh, case, uh, that case that finally broke the blacklist. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know whether there was. I don't know whether there's any one thing that that uh, that that broke it really. Essentially, uh, I think, as I said, they first of all they run out of communists. <laughs> and, and, uh, second, the, the Cold War I think had taken. A, you know, it was gone into some kind of thaw. They accomplished their purpose. They had broken, you know, the militant wing of the, of, of, of the unions. They got rid of all the, you know, the other people they did. Uh, McCarthy had been discredited. Uh, you know, and uh, so I think that I think that Johnny Falk thing was probably, you know, probably pushed it along, probably helped it a, a good deal because it, you know, uh, there was several other. Uh, uh, Law cases, legal cases that never went anywhere. His was the first one, but you know where they really went, and I think that scared them. I think they thought, oh, oh, you know, we can we can lose here. What was that case? Uh, he was a. I've forgotten a lot about it. He was a, a kind of a folksy humorist from Texas, and uh, generally a liberal guy. And uh, he was blacklisted, and he sued. I think Louis Neiser represented him. <laughs> And he won his case. A lot of money. Yeah. Randy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Walter, two linked questions. Uh, the first story I ever wrote never sold was about blacklisting. So I remember going through files of stuff in the mid 1970s and going through all the copies of Red Channel. So this is a college student. I'm reading these things. And the preponderance of uh, in the television and radio industry, because that was Red Challenge, this is after the, the movie, uh, but the preponderance of Jewish names was striking. And as a kid, I'm looking at it, and I couldn't help but reach the conclusion that it was a purge of Jews in the entertainment industry. And I wanted to ask you about that. The second thing I wanted to ask, you mentioned the breaking of the unions, where Reagan had had a, a, a kind of a legendary fight with Yahtzee. The second kind of link question, how much of this was just about economics played out in another field, about the, uh, the advertising agencies and the unions and the studios and others just basically trying to uh, uh, gain economic power over others? 
Well, uh, uh, there had been a strike, a very, very bitter strike in, in Hollywood from uh, the craft unions that, uh, that, that they broke. I know, just, I guess that was in, I don't know, 40s, early 40s, mid, no, uh, mid 40s. I'm sure there always was an, an economic aspect to it, certainly as far as the unions were concerned. Very, very strongly, I think that, because what they went after was the, was, was the militants in, in the unions. You know, and, uh, uh, as far as the Jews were concerned, you know, uh, I think there was certainly a very strong anti-Semitic element uh, in the House Committee. Uh, and, uh, they would, for example, I know with a number of the actors who were Jewish and who had changed their names, for example, they would insist uh, that uh, the actors tell them what their original name was, their original Jewish name, Polish, Russian, whatever, <coughs> you know, whatever that, uh, uh, whatever that was. And uh, I don't know whether they specifically went after Jews in the entertainment industry. I really don't know whether, you know, uh, you could make an argument, I think, probably, that uh, maybe there were more Jews in the entertainment industry because, you know, we have natural rhythm. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I know certainly on the committee, you know, which, uh, there was a very strong Yes, I was uh, surprised by your willingness to um, accept Kazan's uh, activities, and uh, I wondered how you felt when he testified, and also about the award, the, the Academy Award. Well, uh, I was writing a play for him at the time that uh, he testified, and uh, admired him. He was a good, the most seductive man I'd ever met. I thought he was wonderful. You had a long time affair with Marilyn Monroe, apparently, too, so... That counts. That, 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 that counts. <laughs> uh, and I was very surprised when he testified the way he did, mainly because he'd always presented himself to me, you know, as someone on the left, someone who was a socialist, someone who believed in uh, these things. Uh, and so uh, I know I always believed that in, in in some way he had made a choice. His choice really was to go with the power, to go with uh, to whatever reason. He was a complicated man. He was a man with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he wrote a very interesting autobiography, uh, like most autobiographies, very self-serving, but. There are brilliant things that particularly about directly, but through it all, he's, he's a man with a chip on his shoulder. And his attitude is screw everybody else. So, you know. And when they gave him the award, I was against it. And I, and I went on Larry King and talked to the talked about it. If they had given him an award for a specific show or a movie or something like that, I wouldn't have been against it. That was the, the work that I felt he shouldn't be. This was a, an award for a lifetime achievement, and one of his achievements, big achievements, was hurting other artists. You know, that's what he did. You know, and I felt he shouldn't be rewarded for that on that basis. Uh, Bernstein, I wondered if you knew uh, uh, Jeff Corey when you were doing your days in Hollywood, because. Uh, I was very fortunate enough to study with him during the 1950s. He was a great teacher. Beg pardon? He was a great teacher. He was one of the best, most respected acting teachers in Hollywood. And the main reason he was is because he was blacklisted, first of all, and couldn't support his family and couldn't get a job as an actor. So then he went to UCLA, studied psychology, and came back and started acting classes. And every major studio, as he explained to me, used to send him all their stars and starlets to get them, to coach them through their particular roles that they were given. And he said, if I wanted to subvert anybody, I had a perfect opportunity. <laughs> I once went through the Los Angeles County Museum Gallery with him 
we were going to a football game at the Coliseum later that day. And through the door opposite uh, the gallery came a man and a woman. Jeff suddenly froze and just stood and stared. And he didn't tell me afterwards uh, what was happening. It happened to be the man who was the chief counsel for the Un-American Activities Committee, who he testified before in Los Angeles when they were holding sessions there. And that particular person wouldn't allow Jeff, who had served in the Navy during the World War II as a photographer shooting kamikaze planes, pictures of kamikaze planes hitting the deck where he was standing. They wouldn't allow him to enter that record. And the emotional thing that I felt at the time and that he felt was incredible. But it just shows the irony and the ludicrousness of the whole uh, activity that went on there. There was a great story that's in your book about Tiro Mostel, the person who had with, was it Ron so, No, it was Lee Cobb. No, Lee Cobb. We, I remember walking along the street with Tiro Mostel, and the actor Lee Cobb came toward us, and Cobb had named Tiro in his testimony. And I put my hand on Don Tiro's arm, and I could feel the muscles, the muscles twitching. I thought he was going to kill Cobb. They came up and he didn't, of course, but the car just kept, as the car came closer to us, he just kept, car kept just shaking his head and saying, no, 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 and walk, walk, walk past us. But it was funny because I remember another story that uh, I tell in the book by James Dean, uh, whom uh, I met on the street with a, a, I was with a direct name, Martin Ritt, who knew Dean, and, uh, uh, it was right after Kazan testified, you know, and all of us were kind of cursing the Kazan out and thing, and he was saying, oh, I'm not going to work with him again, and uh, uh, the time passed, and Dean was in East, east of Eden, Kazan directed. And uh, a little while after that, he ran into Dean again in New York in the street, you know, and he came up to us, he came up to us, he, he, he said, he made me a star. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ludicrous time, it was a grotesque time in many ways. I didn't know Jeff, I met him a couple of times out there, but I know people who studied with him, and he was just a marvelous teacher. Mr. Bernstein, could you talk to us about the movie The Front? Obviously it was your story. Did you go? Lee Allen, did he come to you? How did that happen? It's a marvelous, marvelous. Martin Ritt, who, the director who had also been blacklisted and who was a close friend, he and I always wanted to do a movie about the blacklist. And the movie we had in mind was really a, a straightforward dramatic piece about somebody who's blacklisted and what happens to him and all the rest of it. We could never get anybody interested. Care about it, you know. We meet periodically and try it, and nobody wanted to do it. And then we had hit on the idea of going at it sideways, you know, making it a comedy and making it not about somebody blacklisted, but a front. And uh, we went to a studio where we knew the head of the studio that, and uh, he was interested enough to put up some money for a first draft script, which I wrote. And uh, but nobody in mind, you know, just wrote it. And uh, he took it back to him and he said, this is fine and I'll do it to get a star. And I said, he said, you know, who are you thinking of? You know, he said, Robert Redford, Paul Newman, Warren Beatty, you know, and he said, well, that's about who are, who are interested in. And uh, uh, so we didn't know what to do then. You know, we didn't know where to go. And uh, I just remember one time when Marty Rick and I were playing tennis and he suddenly said, what about that kid? <laughs> and I said, what kid? Marty had a very gruff manner, but, you know, and uh, he said, that funny kid. I said, who? He couldn't remember who. He just meant that the funny kid, it was very good, it was a, and it was Woody, you know, and I said, that's a wonderful idea. And we just sent the script to him. And uh, he read it and uh, liked it, liked what it said. 
particularly uh, it was a straight part for him, which he then wanted to play. And he admired my um, the director. And he made it possible. And, you know, and uh, uh, once he agreed, the studio agreed, you know, and uh, Woody came on it as an actor, and that's all he did. That's all he was. He was uh, the fact that he didn't write anything in it uh, at all. He did one thing that was that was interesting. The last uh, sequence of the picture, the last scene of the picture, is this this uh, schleppy guy testifying before the uh, uh, un American committee. And we shot it, and uh, we looked at it afterward in the uh, uh, screening room. And I thought it wasn't it wasn't funny enough. And what he said, well. Let's do it again. Let me in improvise. Uh, and uh, he said, "Fine." He did my set. The instructor said, "Yes." Yeah, and we shot it again. And he improvised about ten minutes. With him. And he was hilarious. He did riffs on he was a kid stealing Girl Scout cookies. I remember. And some, he was just wonderful. He was just the crew was falling down. And it ruined the movie. <laughs> I mean, it just was, we were doing the show. We couldn't use it, uh, you know, at, at all. And that was the only, it was the only ride, you know. I or anything you did. At Lucille Ball or something had done a similar thing. And who was in front of me that talked all sorts of babble and just confused them? Was it? Oh, Lionel Standard did it, and Zero did it also, I think, before the committee. They just, uh, you know, confused them. And they got rid of it.